Um, so if you don't mind today, I want to start out by telling you a little bit about myself and my family and what we've gone through the past couple years, because that's going to launch us right into what we're talking about today. In 2014, I, my dream finally happened. I accepted a job as a youth pastor in a small Baptist church in Maryland. That was like my goal in life at the time. I really wanted to be in ministry in a church. It was, I was so excited. It was so fun. And we moved up there from Missouri. Not only was I a youth pastor at a church, but also I was a teacher at a school nearby. Like two things that I love to do. I love working with youth. I still do. I enjoy everything that I do right now uh, teaching at the school I teach at right now. But as time went on, things started to occur in my personal life and in my Bible study and talking with my wife and some godly counselors that I went to. We started reading the Bible in a different way. And things started to make a lot more sense. And short story short, we became reformed. And in the circle that I was walking in, that was not a good thing. <laughs> um, it caused a lot of trouble. So we actually tried to keep it secret for a long time. But when, when teenagers started asking questions, we started having some issues. Because I tried to beat around the bush because I didn't want to address it directly, and we started having problems. Uh, and long story short, um, we voluntarily left the church that we were uh, working at. Um, the problem was is that they provided us for housing, so we ended up moving with a lady with a disability and helped her out for a year. Um, so we still had my job at the school, and it was going great there, um, but they soon found out that horrible truth as well. <laughs> And uh, after a month of trying to convince me otherwise, they let me go from there. So, not only did we not have a house, we did not have any income. And uh, worst case scenario, the lady that we were living with asked us to leave as well, um, just with three kids in her house. It was, especially if you know Dusty, you know. And the people that laughed understand completely. <laughs> um, it just made it really difficult for her. So we were without a house, without a job. We ended up moving in to an old musty church attic. So we went from my dream, we had everything prepared for, we had everything that we needed, down to literally having nothing. And it was awful. Um, and then by what we can describe as only God's providence, out of the blue, randomly, a school in Jacksonville, Florida, called me and my wife up, asking us to come down there and teach. And I said, hey, we're not, I mean, we're, we can go, we can be down there ASAP. We have nothing holding us right here. I mean, so uh, it, it was weird. Without even a face-to-face -face interview, in 24 hours, we had contracts in our email. Signed it and sent it, and then we moved down here three weeks later. Um, and now we are here, and you're stuck with me. So um, that, that was last year, and, and man, it, it was just an amazing turn of events of how we went from everything that we ever wanted down to nothing, and God has finally fulfilled his promise of making all things work together for good for those who love God to us. Now, I say all that to say this. We're going to be looking at a man today who seemed to have everything going for him, like he had everything that he needed, but God had better plans for him, greater plans for him. And this man's name was Moses. Moses. Now, Moses also had an interesting story. Israel was currently living as slaves in the land of Egypt. For four, 400 years earlier, their forefathers moved there. God had before then been regularly speaking to them, but after the nation moved to Egypt, it seemed he went quiet. God had made amazing promises to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Promises of bounty, promises of provision, promises of delivery. But when someone doesn't talk to you for 400 years, you think maybe they forgot about you? Especially when you're going through such a hard time. They were slaves in their land. All the promises God made to the nation had seemed to be going unanswered. As the years went on and the nation of Israel began to grow, the Pharaoh at the time was not happy. 
He was afraid that that nation would rise up and overthrow Egypt. That's how populous they were becoming. So he ordered that all baby boys be killed at birth. That had to be a difficult thing for the Israelites to hear. What an evil, wicked act he, he, he commanded them. But as time went on and Moses' mother um, what became pregnant with him, she decided that there was no way that he, she was going to do that to her baby boy. So she weaved a basket, waterproofed the basket, placed the baby in the basket, and put him in the river. That sounds weird. The baby was going to die anyway, so might as well try this option. Maybe something will happen. She sent her daughter to watch over the basket as I was floating in the river. And again, what can only be described as the providence of God that basket washed up next to Pharaoh's daughter. I can only imagine the fright in Miriam's, that was Moses' sister's name, a Miriam's uh, heart when she saw that. But then what happened next was odd. Pharaoh's daughter would have been completely aware of the command her father made. But she opened the basket, saw that it was a Hebrew baby, and she felt compassion towards it. She looked at it and said, looked at him and said, I, 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 we, we got to take care of this baby, but I can't do that. So Miriam runs up, who was watching the entire time, and says, hey, I know a lady who can take care of your baby. Moses' mother. So Moses' mother was allowed to raise her child, at least as a child, uh, when all the other uh, mothers had issues doing that. Well, as Moses grew older, he saw some things that troubled him. He saw how his people were being persecuted by the Egyptians. And as he grew older, he started to become angry at seeing this all the time. Furious. And one day he walked out and he saw an Israelite being beaten by an Egyptian. And he was so full of rage, he went and he killed the Egyptian. Now, this was an issue. You have one of the princes of Egypt now, in a way, murdering someone, and now he had to run. So he, was, he had everything that he ever needed, but he did something that made him a fugitive and an outcast. He ran and ran and ran to Midian, where he met his wife and took a job as a shepherd. And that is where we find ourselves today. We, uh, if, you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible... So page 46 in the Bibles in the racks in front of you, um, it's, yeah. Um, but Exodus chapter 3. Now, here, we have an interesting turn of events. We have a man who was the prince of Egypt for 40 years, becoming a lowly shepherd. Talk about a demotion. But then, after years and years of silence to Israel, God finally spoke, and he spoke to this fugitive, nonetheless. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 says this, <clears throat> Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not being burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take, off, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. After 40 years of living in royalty, he was now working for his father-in-law, Jethro, as a shepherd. And being a shepherd was not the easiest job in the world. 
You had to guide not so smart animals, not only to the proper area to feed, but also to find proper water. You would watch them all day, having to fend off predators that maybe wanted a good helping of lamb chops. You also had to keep constant, a constant count to make sure you did not lose any, as they loved to wander off by themselves, or maybe they did end up becoming a snack. Shepherding was a common occupation in the ancient Near East, so it's not surprising to find Moses occupied with such work. From a theological viewpoint, however, the significance of such an occupation cannot be missed. He who will soon become the shepherd of God's people undergoes training in Midian. God had a work for Moses to do, and to train him, he knew Moses had to understand how to lead stubborn sheep. Because if you know anything about the nation of Israel, they became very stubborn. Now, it was most likely hot out, and he was probably very tired. Now, I've never wandered or walked through the wilderness for hours on end, and to be honest, I don't have the desire to. Uh, it doesn't sound very fun. Um, but I do like to run, and when I run out in the heat, well, if I overdo it, things start to occur in my head, and maybe you understand if you work in the heat too often. I, like, kind of zone out, become very tired, and I just run. I'm, I'm thinking about water because I drink a lot of water. I start thinking of water and air conditioning and my recliner, maybe just, you know, a nice, relaxing evening. Um, in fact, if, when one is out in the heat too long, he, it can lead to maybe dramatic overheating. Now, I'm sure that Moses was fully capable of, and prepared for walking in the wilderness for extended periods of time, but something showed up that may have had him start to question his sanity. The day had probably begun much like any other, with, with Moses out in the wilderness tending his sheep. He was simply minding his own business, but a person never knows when his life might be changed forever by an encounter with the living God. Not a chance encounter. For it was God's providence that led Moses to the far side of the desert. He saw what appeared to be a bush burning, which may not have been too odd of a sight to see in that area, but what was really astonishing was that this bush was not being burnt by the fire. It was completely intact. Nothing was wrong with it. And as he walked closer to the flame, he realized something important. This was no ordinary fire. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame. And not only did he see a bush not being burned, not only was an angel of the Lord in the fire, but a voice came from it crying his name nonetheless. So this bush knew its name. Wow. Okay, maybe I need some water here. All he could say from this shocking turn of events was, yeah, that's me. I'm Moses. Then the voice said something startling. It said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Holy ground. This is the first time in the Bible where we see the word holy being used in reference to God. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but in order to establish what we are dealing with, we need a solid foundation on what holiness is. Riken puts it like this. Holiness means separation. Something holy is set apart. In the case of God, holiness means that he is set apart from everything he has made. Holiness is not simply his righteousness, although that is a part of it, but also his otherness. It is the distinction between the creator and the creature. The infinite distance between God's deity and our humanity. God says, I am God and not man. The holy Lord among you. Hosea 11.9, his people respond by crying, there is no one holy like the Lord. Now, the ground that Moses was standing on was holy or set apart by God for a specific purpose. As holy, not only was this ground set apart, it was set apart from the God 
set apart by the God who is also set apart. This ground was not holy because there was anything special about the dirt and the rocks that were there. It was holy because of the one who was there. This one is holy. As a holy God, he had to set himself apart from all things unclean. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't set apart necessarily from the sandals Moses was wearing, but the uncleanliness of what Moses was. That would include Moses' sin. Notice here, Moses wasn't struck with fear just by the declaration of the ground being holy. He was struck with fear with the one who was saying these words. And who was that? In verse 6, it says, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This was the holy God of his fathers. This was the God that made promises back to Abraham. This was the God that Moses may have heard many stories about. When Moses was introduced to who he was speaking to, his mind would have flashed to who he was. He may have thought about how he heard about this God creating everything. He may have heard about the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Or how maybe he would have thought about how this God providentially led Joseph to where his people were currently enslaved in order to save a world from hunger. When Moses heard who this God was, all he could do was hide his face, partly out of fear of who he was speaking to and out of fear of what he himself had done. He was now facing the holy living God. Let's keep on reading. Verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of the taskmaker, taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have, been, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, this should have been comforting to Moses. For years, it would have seemed that Moses had, uh, that the God had forgotten about his people. For 400 years, the people of Israel had not heard anything from God. And Moses was the one he was reintroduced to. This should have been comforting to Moses because he had heard that God had seen the pain his people were going through. God saw all the injustice. God heard their cries for help. And God had for not forgotten the promises he had made to people. This should have and could have been comforting to Moses. So why wasn't it? Let's look at the obstacles here because God was not afraid to lie them flat out for Moses. The first obstacle God made Moses aware about was the land of Canaan itself. Now, whenever we read these passages or talk about the land of Canaan, we're quick to stop at the positive sides, right? We talk about the good and broad land. This land would have been perfect for them as if it were made specifically for them big enough to fit the entire nation for years to come. Not only was this land large and broad and perfect for them, but it was also a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, no, you couldn't just take your pail and walk down to Honey River and fill it up a bucket and then go and butter your bread with that. That's not what this meant. What this means is that this was a land that was bountiful, that their provisions would be met, that they would have everything that they needed. This land was perfect, 
And it had been the dream of the Israelites to get back there for years. And finally, God had talked to Moses and said, we can go there. But that's not where God stopped at. God continued on to these issues. God does not stop his explanation of the land with those two highlights. First, he brings up all the people that are currently living there. Look at this. Groups that would not appreciate a new nation waltzing right in and taking over their land. You have the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Moses was a shepherd, not a general. Moses couldn't do this, and to be frank, Moses was right. He was in no way qualified to lead this endeavor. He had never led a large conquest. None of the Israelites had. And Moses, in his own strength, would have thought that he would have led God's people to their deaths. And most likely, he was right. And unfortunately for Moses, that was not the only obstacle Moses brought across. In fact, the next one was more imminent and probably more dangerous for Moses himself. Look at what God says. He says, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, if Moses was not talking to the holy, living God at this point, he may have rolled in laughter. (laughs) Understand this command. God had just commanded Moses, a fugitive and outcast in in Egypt, to waltz into one of the strongest nations on the earth, barge into the courts of Pharaoh, face most likely someone he grew up alongside, and demand that they release all the workers the nation had been using for the past 400 years. This would have been detrimental to the economy in Egypt, leaving a major workforce shortage. This command seemed ridiculous. Moses echoes that thought when he cries, who am I? Why me? Why am I being asked to do this? But I want us to notice God's response to Moses. God's focus was on the freedom of his people. And when God makes a promise, he is bound to keep it. God did not say, hey, yo, I'm your biggest fan. You got this, buddy. Just go get him. You just got to believe in yourself. No, he didn't say that. Moses and God are about to embark on an extremely long conversation where Moses is about to throw out every excuse he can think of to try to get out of doing this. But every answer God gives is in response is built on the foundation of this first simple yet so profound phrase. Verse 12, but I will be with you. We tend to think about Moses being the heroic man who does so much for the children of Israel, leading them for many years to come and doing so many marvelous works for God. But everything Moses does is a result of what God initially told him here. God said, I will be with you. Moses is the secondary character here. God is the star of the show. Now, let's continue on here, because Moses brings up a very valid question. Verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? There were over 2,000 gods in the Egyptian pantheon. 2,000. Some of these deities' names are well known even in today's age. Isis, Osiris, Horus, Amun, Ra, and then there were many others not heard of as often. These names would have been used widely around the land of Egypt and widely around the Israelites. There is no doubt that Israel would want to know for sure that Moses was working for the God of Abraham and not some imposter trying to make their lives more difficult. Moses' question was very valid, and the name of this God would be extremely useful. And God lays out his name for Moses. Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. To Moses, God's name was important. To Moses, God's name was more than just a name. It represented his entire character and reputation. God's name is not recorded anywhere prior to this event. The answer to Moses the answer Moses received was a revelation of God's very being and attributes. I am who I am. That was God's answer. Moses probably spent the rest of his life reflecting on this magnificent name of God. Some people interpret this name as meaning, I will be who I will be, or I cause to be who I cause to be, or what I cause to be. The meaning of this name is so deep and holy, men cannot fully understand it. But if you would, let me give you a short summary of what I've read on the name and give you a limited meaning of it, again, because this name is so deep and rich for us to grasp in its entirety. I am who I am. This is God. This God has always been, and this God has always been God. This God causes all things. This is God. This God, this awesome God, this holy God was now speaking to a sinful and broken fugitive. The magnificence of this God is so immeasurable, we need to just bathe in the awe and the greatness of who he is. He is not just some fly on the wall. He is not a genie that just bends to our whim. He does not need our okay to act. He has a will and he will accomplish it. He is in charge of all. He commands all. Moses would follow God's command. Pharaoh would bend to his will. The people of God would be freed from their bondage. The promises that God made to Israel centuries before would be fulfilled. Why? Because God is who God is. God causes all things. Now, many of us know the rest of the story. God uses Moses to go to uh, to Egypt and uses him to perform many amazing works and many judgments upon the land. And God's people did get let go. God's people were freed from their bondage just like God promised. And this morning, I want to be assured of this truth right here. That our holy God delivers his people. Our holy God delivers his people. Now, how does our holy God deliver his people? We see two ways he delivers his people that are just as true today as they were back then. He does so in the first place by keeping his holy promises. Turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We see here God laying out a covenant between himself and Abraham. Genesis chapter 15. We could spend hours discussing this covenant between Abraham and God. And if you attend community college, you know that is true completely. But I'm hungry too. So we will adjust just one of these promises God made to Abraham. The one that is so specific to Israel's current situation, we we got to read this. Genesis 15, verse 12 through 14 says this, and this is amazing. And mind you, this happened over 400 years before what our conversation prior. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, later known as Abraham. And behold, a dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment upon the nation that they serve 
and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Mind blown. Like, this is amazing. God gave Abraham a promise that his offspring, the nation of Israel, would go through a lot of anguish and turmoil as servants to another nation. But this slavery that they were going through was in no way a surprise to God. God told Abraham about it centuries earlier. God told Abraham that he would pour his judgment on the nation that afflicted his people. And God promised Abraham that his offspring would be freed from this slavery. Centuries earlier. Because God causes all things. And God knows all things. So let's take this back to Moses. All the Israelites would have been completely aware of this promise God made to Abraham. They, they would know that soon, and in their day, very soon, because I'm sure they were counting down the time, God would be doing wonders in the land of their captors, and they would be set free from their bondage. Now, who was making this promise to them? And who made this promise to Moses? The I am who I am. And what have we learned about this God? This is God. This God has always been, and this God has always been God. This God causes all things. This is God. And this God that causes all things must be able to work out his promise and his timing. And the people of Israel would be, and they were, freed from their bondage. And God was going to use Moses to accomplish it. Now, let's take this back to us. Are we ever tempted to think that God has forgotten his promises to us? I know that when my family was living in that musty attic, I doubted God's faithfulness over and over and over again. I thought he had forgotten about us. I mean, we stayed true to his word. We sacrificed a lot to stay true to what God said. We didn't compromise, and it seemed to have hurt us. Maybe God didn't love us after all. We had forgotten about the promises found in Romans chapter 8, that nothing will ever separate us from his love. Maybe you're going through something like that, or maybe you're feeling very similar. Because if you're anything like me, those thoughts come quite often. Maybe you're doubting God's promise of love to you. I am not here to tell you that it will be easy. But I will tell you that if you are his child, then nothing will take you away from that love. This is a promise from the I am. And just like God had not forgotten about Israel, God will not forget about you. And that is so comforting. And that can be applied to many different promises God gives us. When God makes a promise, God causes all things. God will fulfill that promise. Now, how does our holy God deliver his people? He not only does so by keeping his holy promise, but secondly, by providing his holy presence. Remember earlier, while engulfed in a holy flame, God told Moses that he would be with him. Moses could not do this by himself. Moses was just the supporting role in this story. God was the main character. Without God with him, all this would be in vain. God was the one who would lead his people out of slavery with his presence. Exodus 13 21 through 22 shows us the physical manifestation of this presence for Israel. After the people had left Israel, they needed direction. And God was the one that was going to give them that direction with his presence. And the Lord, and this is uh, Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night in a pillar of fire 
to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. The Lord led them in in the clouds and in fire. And the cloud and the fire stayed with them just like God promised. And this would have been a huge comfort to Israel. I mean, wouldn't it be to you? To see a big, huge pillar of fire out right in front of you, knowing that that's the holy living God, I think I would feel a little safe. I mean, I thought I felt safe having a police officer living in the apartment complex next to me. But I'd feel a little safer, I'd feel a little safer with the holy God right there. This would have been a huge comfort for the Israelites, for they would always be aware of the presence of God. There was something they could focus on as a reminder to them that God was with them. Now, we also should notice here, and we can't skip by it, the fulfillment of the promise in verse 12 of chapter 3. God led the nation back to the mountain, and God gave his people the Ten Commandments there. Remember the passage? It says that you will, you will serve God on this mountain. And lo and behold, later on, they returned back back to the mountain in Exodus chapter 10. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments there, and after a whole ordeal, they did worship God there. God's promise uh, that he was with them was fulfilled, and this is how Moses would know that God was with them. Now, we know why this account was preserved for Israel. To remind them that God would be would follow through with his side of the covenant and be with them as long as they served him. But why was this account preserved for us nearly 3,500 years after the events took place? I will submit to you that the reason is the same reason why God preserved it for Israel, to remind us that our holy God will deliver his people and will keep his promises. As amazing, as amazing as the burning bush was, in that it was the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise of freedom for Israel, it pales in comparison to God becoming flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, freeing us from another type of bondage. This was another promise that God had made, a promise made to, a, uh, to Adam, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, Now, no, we are not literal slaves in bondage to a nation, crying out in anguish, wishing to be released. But as human beings, we are born in bondage to something. John chapter 8, and if you will turn there, we're going to have an awesome time there for a brief moment. John chapter 8 has amazing parallels to what we just talked about. Verse 34 through 36 tells us our state and what has been done about it. Jesus answered them. And the them is the Jews who are quite angry at Jesus by this point. (laughs) You want to read through the passage. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Here it is. Apart from Jesus, anyone here who has ever sinned is a slave to that sin. You are bound to it. You can't stop doing it. You're stuck there. And God, as holy, must separate himself and separate himself from that wickedness. But what is the promise that we see here? That if you are set free by the Son, you will be free. Free from that sin, but what, or should I say who, is the basis for that promise? 
We know that the Israelites had the I am who I am. They had the holy God binding themselves in covenant to them, making promises to them. But what about us? In the same exact passage we just read, where Christ talks about us being a slave to sin and be made free from that sin, he makes another startling claim. Jesus was in a heated discussion with the Jews. Jesus had called them out and called them out hard. They got angry, so furious with Jesus. They started claiming that Jesus had a demon, that Jesus was wicked. And they then accused Jesus of making himself more important than their father, Abraham. These were really rough claims that they were hearing. So let's look in verse 53. Verse 53. Are you greater, this is the Jews speaking, are you greater than Abraham, our father, who died? And the prophets who died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glory myself, My glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is your God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old, and you say you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the uh, the temple. Did you catch it? Did you see why the Jews were so angry here? Did you see why they picked up stones to throw at him? And in doing so, they were trying to kill him there. Did you catch it? Verse 58, Jesus says, Before Abraham was, I am. This was a direct reference back to the name given to Moses. Jesus is God himself. The Jews had recognized Jesus had declared himself to be God. And the Jews wanted to kill him. The importance of this cannot be missed. Just like the I am promised Moses that he would deliver Israel from the land of Egypt, the I am promises that if you are set free by the Son, you will be free. Jesus is God himself. And if you are set free from sin by Christ, you can rest assured because he is God and he will fulfill his holy promise. He will deliver you as well. Now, how is one set free by the Son here? To be delivered by the I Am. The Bible is filled with the command. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe that Jesus is the I am and trust that he died for your sins and trust that he rose again. And as he was delivered from the grave, you will be delivered from your sin and death as well. And not only do you have that promise to rest assured in, that holy promise, you also have the promise of his holy presence with you. Matthew 28, Christ says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is bound to your heart, and he will never leave. Moses and Israelites had a pillar of fire in front of them. We have Christ bound to us. He is bound to your heart. This is, is an amazing promise. 
Now, there was nothing special about Moses at all. He was just a fugitive outcast shepherd. But what gave him the boldness to face Pharaoh was that the I am was with him. And the Israelites would be delivered. Now, there is nothing special about your eye. We are just fugitive slaves to sin. But what gives us the boldness and power in our lives is that we have the I am with us. And our holy God will deliver his people. And what do we know about this God? This is the I am who I am. We know that this is God. And this God has always been. And this God has always been God. This God causes all things. And this is God. 